December the 1st of 2020. We have 31 days left of this year. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Hi, sister. Carrie Steinke's on, and Lynn Miller Walters is with us, and Lori and Shirley. Good to have you guys on. Love seeing your pretty faces on here. As my friend Debbie would say, your lipstick looks pretty. Hi, Judy. Good to see you this morning. So we're uh, reading in uh, Daniel chapter 8. And once again, we get to see <clears throat> um, another vision from Daniel. And there's lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff written about these scriptures that are they're written. Um, again, I'm very intrigued by Daniel having the vision. I'm very intrigued by Daniel's reaction to the vision and his response to the vision. Um, what an amazing thing to have Gabriel come and explain your vision. Wow. Wow, <laughs> man, and it was so, um, it was such a, hmm, what's the right word? I know the, the text today says terrifying. Um, verse 17, as Gabriel approached the place where I was standing, I became so terrified that I fell with my face to the ground. Mm, 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 mm. Mm, yeah. So, anyway, um, some say that this dream actually occurred, that this dream came true under Alexander the Great when he arose. Because at the time that Daniel had this dream, Greek was a non-entity. I mean, it was, it was not a superpower. Uh, but under Alexander the Great, uh, Greek, uh, Greece rose up as a superpower, but unfortunately his life was cut short at age 30. So this was in 376 BC. And then, then of course there's others that take this prophecy as a total prophecy for end times. There's others that'll take just that last horn that came forth. That you remember in the dream, um, the goat had four horns. Okay, so the goat started off with one horn between his eyes it got broke off and then four horns uh, grew out and then one smaller one grew in between those four. And there's many that says that um, that is the coming of the Antichrist at the end times right before the second coming of, of Jesus. So <clears throat> anyway, um, but again, I've just this particular year for some reason have been very intrigued by Daniel. Um, and his response and how he conducts himself. And then once again, to think that he's in captivity. Um, this is his third king that he's been under in captivity. His whole life was altered. I mean, so many of us base our whole life on what happens our first 18 years, how we grow up, our childhood, we start forming our thoughts, our ideas about what life's going to look like. You know, along about grade school, they start asking us, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then along about junior high, it's what are you going to take when you go to college? And, you know, it just continues on to where by the time our kids are 18, they're supposed to have the whole world figured out. And so they think they've got their whole world figured out. And then life happens and life may or may not look like what they thought it was going to look like. Almost always it does not. Um, and, and so, you know, Daniel was no different. Daniel grew up and had a certain lifestyle, and then all of a sudden that life is interrupted with a war and was being held captive and then being taken into royal service and he didn't stop operating in his giftings at all. If anything, they just got stronger. And we think it's hard to serve God, <laughs> just getting up off our soft pillows every morning. Hmm. So anyway, we'll move on to 1 John, which I think is so related to what we just said. <laughs> 
to have that kind of intimacy with the Father is just, wow, to know who you are, to know your gifts in such a way that it doesn't matter that you're a slave, that your happiness and your joy isn't dependent on your physical circumstances. I mean, what a, what a novel idea that our, our happiness and our joy is not dependent on our physical circumstances. We base everything on it. When my back hurts, I'm in a bad mood. When my kids don't do what I think they should, I'm in a bad mood. When Tom gets up grumpy, I'm in a bad mood. When, hmm, hmm, you know, everything is always somebody else's fault. And it's always directed outward. You know, when we're created, when God breathed into Adam, he formed his body he made an image of his body out of dust. And then God breathed his, his breath into Adam. And that body that was formed around him, that included his mind, his will and his emotions, when that life was breathed into them, that entire silhouette of a body was designed to serve that spirit man that was in him, that was in him. But then when Eve comes up and says, oh, look, look what the serpent gave me. It's the apple from the tree. Then no longer was Adam focused inward. His whole attention turned outward. And it was about, oh, I want more. I want more. Hmm. And now that Jesus Christ has came, and the book of John, chapter 2, is definitely teaching us more and more. Jesus righted everything again so that we can live inwardly focused to who he is in us instead of being driven by everything out here. That the source from everything out here that we need comes from within us comes from within us. The answer to everything comes from within us. Hmm. John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 17 is where we find ourselves today. And this is all about God's heart. I just love the books of John. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of John because it's written by the disciple whom Jesus loved. <clears throat> it's all about love. That's who our Father is. God is love. We've read those words that God is love. And in order to love him, we have to know him. And once again, my good friend Debbie this morning woke up bright and early and did a little research and sent me a, a great article about knowing, the word knowing, and how, you know, in the Bible, when you read the word know, it really is, is a word that also means intimacy. And intimacy, as we know, and we've talked about this before, means intercourse, that we actually know each other, like a husband and a wife know each other. You know, I think we've only scratched the surface in the reason why God made it that a man and a woman comes together in holy matrimony and marriage and the two shall become one. Because once again, he knew he created these physical bodies and he knew that we'd get it, that we'd understand that. Um, because what he wants us to get and understand is his heart. The whole reason why we read, the whole reason why I read anyway, I've just reached a place in my adult life when it was, I, I don't, oh my gosh, I don't want to know what everybody else thinks. I don't want somebody else's opinion, Father. I want your heart. I want to know you. What, what do you have to say about this and that and that and that topic and this problem that comes up and that problem? And how do we deal with this? And how, you know, how do I become a better parent? How do I become a better wife? How do I become a, a better step parent? How do I become a better grandma? How do I become a better person? How do I, 
How do I know you more? Know you more. Know. Once you've read things like that article that Debbie has sent me, and you understand that when he's talking about knowing us, that it's to the nth degree of intimacy that there ever was, it changes the way you read the whole Bible. Uh, and the knowing, the knowing, the oneness, the two shall become one. And with that backdrop, we'll look at a couple of things in today's reading in 1 John. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. That's good news right there, folks. And it shows us our Father's heart. He pleads, uh, uh, he is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. You think it's not important that we read the Old Testament and understand what that phrase right there means? If we haven't read the Old Testament and read about the many, 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 many sacrifices the killing of animals over and over and over and over again. I mean, there's been times that as I read through the Old Testament with you guys and I come online, I talk about they killed and slaughtered so many animals for the sacrifice. I can't even imagine the smell that permeated the area, air, air with the air with those sacrifices. If we don't understand what that means, this, this phrase right here, this, this sentence to us, he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. We can't have the true meaning of what that is without having the history that leads up to this. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. I'm telling you, our religious upbringing leaves that word all out. It's all, <laughs> all the world. And, and we can be sure that we know him. There it is. Oh, the whole reason why I read, I want to know him. It's the whole reason why I pray and I praise and I listen. I listen. See, a husband and a wife come together in a way the article that Debbie sent me said that, you know, reminded us how a husband and wife come together in a way that is not shared with anybody else. And then this knowing of one another that we feel like a husband and wife knows each other in ways that nobody else, not even the mama who has an umbilical cord connection with the son or the daughter, not a daddy who would lay down his life to die for the son or daughter, has the kind of intimacy that a husband and a wife have. That's knowing. We know each other. That's how our Father wants to know us, and he wants us to know him. It is how our Father knows us, and he, and he longs for us to know him. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. Mm. Mm. This is New Testament. If we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and he is not living in truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. They show how completely they know him. They, they show how completely they're intimate with him. That is how we know that we're living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one you've had from the very beginning. <laughs> There's so much in here I could keep going. I could, there's so much that can be said about these words that, that this isn't a new commandment. <laughs> it's the one you've already had since the beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message that you heard before, yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment and you also are living it. 
for the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims I'm living in light but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, and they've been blinded by the darkness. Mm -mm -mm. Let's jump over to verse 15. Do not love this world nor the things it has to offer you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Why do we grow up our children saying, what do you want to be when you grow up? What are you going to do when you go to college? What's your, what's your degree going to be in? Why do we not grow up our kids saying, what did God speak to you today? What's God saying today? Because if we grow our kids up, understanding what God is speaking to them, they'll already know what college to go to. They'll already know what their major ought to be. They will already know the vision that God has for them if we teach them starting at a very young age to listen for our Father's voice. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. Hmm. Only a craving for physical pleasure. Our words breeds that. What do you want to be when you grow up? What's your definition of success? The only definition of success we need is to know and love our Father. Because if we know and love our Father, everything else works its way out. But the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievement and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. We will not die. We will not die. And we'll end with Proverbs 28, verses 25 and 26. Greed causes fighting. Trusting the Lord leads to prosperity. Greed causes fighting. I mean, that's just what we just read about in 1 John. Greed causes fighting. Trusting the Lord leads to prosperity. Those who trust their own insights are foolish, but anyone who walks in wisdom is safe. God's wisdom. God's wisdom. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you, Debbie, for taking the time this morning to send that to me. Um, we got lots of good comments going this morning. There's Nicholas. Oh, my friend Nicholas is on. Good morning, buddy. Good to see you. So many of y'all are on with us this morning. I love you guys. I love December. Ooh, ooh, it's when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the whole season that we have. I'm going to already tell y'all Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. You're my favorites. Have a great, great have a terrific Tuesday. Bye-bye.